So welcome everyone, and uh, let's look to the Lord as we begin this time of devotions together. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you, Lord of all the earth. We give you glory and honor and praise for your goodness and mercy, for your justice and kindness. And we pray that your word will speak to our hearts and lives again today. May we be fed and nurtured by it. And may we be encouraged to live from it for your glory and praise. Lord, may all the nations know your goodness and mercy because of Jesus, our Savior, whose name we declare. Amen. Okay, let's turn to Psalm 9. Psalm 9 says this. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my right and my cause. You have sat on your throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted the cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion, and there rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked return to the grave, all the nations that forget God. But the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know if you have ever had an experience that you just couldn't wait to tell others about. I'm sure you have. Something great happened to you and you wanted to share it with your family and friends. Maybe it was a great vacation. Maybe something about your spiritual growth. When I ask, what has God done for you? What comes to mind? The Bible tells us to tell each other about the great things God does in our lives. The Israelites are repeatedly told in the Old Testament to tell their children what God did for them when he brought them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. They're called to celebrate the Passover each year in order to remember and retell that awesome story of salvation. Psalm 9 is the words of David who recounts what God has done for him. The psalm is a reminder to all of us to remember God's actions in the past. In fact, it's not only a reminder to us to do this, I think it's a license to do so. It's David saying, just do it. Drop your guard. Stop holding back. Don't worry about what others think or say. Blurt it out. See, the psalm starts with, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. Then verse 2, he says, he's not only going to tell it, he's going to sing it. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing Praise to your name, O Most High. In verses 3 to 6, he then tells us what he's so thankful for. He tells us what the Lord has done. It comes down to God defeating his enemy. And it certainly sounds like he's talking about an enemy nation, or probably more accurately, nations, plural. My enemies turn back, he says in verse 3. They stumble and perish before you, O Lord. He goes on to explain that the Lord has upheld his cause. The, the Lord has judged righteously. 
David is thankful that the Lord is on his throne, that the judge of the world is God, and that he's just and righteous. Then David elaborates on how the Lord seems to have completely destroyed these particular enemies, even the memory of them. Now, if I think back to some of the previous Psalms, especially Psalms 3 to 7, you might remember that David prayed there for God to help him in the fight against enemies. In this Psalm, David now basks in God's good work of saving him and his people from enemies. I'm not saying David wrote, I can't say that David has wrote this Psalm um, in a particular order, as in he expected it to be Psalm 9 after Psalm 3 to 7 and 8. But no, we don't know that. But someone who arranged the Psalter and may have had this in mind, we don't know that for certain. But we can see clearly in this psalm, all by itself, that David is rejoicing in God's victory over enemies. So stop and think about that in relation to your own life. What enemies have you had to fight in your life? What is it that has uh, troubled you? Sometimes it's cutting words of people that you thought were your friends. Sometimes it's the enemy of sickness. You have to battle physical illness, other times mental illness. Many people have the enemy of racial injustice on their minds these days. Whatever enemy you face, you can be sure to learn from King David that we can trust the king of the universe. Look at verse 7 where David moves from describing what God has done to explaining to the reader why this is so. David gives exuberant praise to the Lord because even as a king on earth, David knows that the Lord is ultimately the one who reigns over the whole world. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 7. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his justice in the world. Or sorry, for, the, for judgment. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in time of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. I think Psalm 9 might have been one of my favorites growing up. You know, as a kid, I remember that this song just, uh, yeah, wholehearted thanksgiving to thee I will bring was the title in the old Blue Psalter hymnal. And, uh, just declaring the praise of God for his awesome work. Verse 2 says, Thou, Lord, art a refuge for all the oppressed. All trust thee who know thee and trusting are blessed. For never, O Lord, did thy mercy forsake the soul that has sought of thy grace to partake. It's a powerful song. And then the chorus, of course, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But David depends on the Lord who's a good ruler. God governs justice justly. I don't envy any human leader in the nations of the world today. You almost always have some segment of your people disagreeing with you, accusing you of not caring or not doing justice. And I'm sure David knew that pain and turmoil as a king as well. But he knew that God always gets it right. That's what he's saying in these verses. God always gets it right. The Lord doesn't make mistakes. He is righteous, meaning simply stated, he knows what's right, and he does it. God knows what is right in any and every situation. He judges justly. He acts in the perfect way. Justice is never overlooked or missed. We've all been appalled in the last week by the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the hands of the police, or literally the knees of the police. It is so sad. The police got it very wrong that day when they tried to take Floyd for allegedly spending counterfeit money. They did not handle that situation righteously. They may not have even had a righteous desire to uphold the law. I'm not going to judge that. But clearly Floyd did not get justice. And that is certainly the case all too often in our society and in our world. In Psalm 9, David is saying that he's totally confident in the justice God hands down. God never makes a mistake. He always gets it right. We can depend on that. We can depend on him. Then back in verse 11, David says what he started out in verse 1. Sing to the 
Lord, sing praises to the Lord and tell the nations, tell people what the Lord has done. The Lord doesn't let enemies get their way. The Lord is there. There's going to be a day of reckoning. God will avenge the blood spilled and will not ignore the cry of the oppressed or afflicted. God has an ear for the underdog we see in the scripture. He has a heart for the oppressed. He desires justice and will ensure justice is done. And so David's asking us, do we believe that? Sometimes the day of reckoning doesn't come fast enough for our liking. Clearly, David has gone through times of feeling like the enemy had the upper hand. Time when it seemed like the enemy was winning or had won. And we feel like that too many times as well. We can be honest about that. The reason we cry out to the Lord for help is that he sometimes seems slow to help, even deaf. He's not hearing us, it seems. But when we get a little farther from the situation, we can see a little more clearly. And looking back, we can trace the finger of the sovereign Lord of the universe, our Lord, the King of the universe. We always want justice quickly. We even have a saying, justice delayed is justice denied. But David isn't counting on humanity's justice to keep him safe. David's tone in this psalm is that the king of kings gets it right every time. His getting it right might not always suit our timetable, but it's not about us. But wait, maybe it is. Yes, it is about us. It's about God's love for us, his sovereign love for us, his love that doesn't always come to us in the packages we prefer, but always comes with our best interests in mind. It has a long-term and even a worldwide goal, even an eternal vision in mind. Bible commentator John Golden Gay translates verse 8 like this. The Lord is the one who makes decisions for the world with faithfulness. He rules the peoples with uprightness. In other words, the Lord, as the ruler of the world, sees a far greater picture than our little corner of the world. He makes decisions for our world. All the nations that are rooted in his character of being faithful. God makes decisions so that all people can see that he's faithful. Did the injustice by Jesus look right and feel right for him at the time, for the people in the day at Jerusalem? Did it seem right for those who believed in him, even for us reading about it? No, it didn't seem like justice. But Jesus suffered injustice. All that the world could throw at him, but he had an eternal and worldwide vision in mind to make us right with God. God's eternal justice and love meet in the person of Jesus, and we are recipients of that. And because we are recipients of such love and faithfulness, number one, we should give thanks to the Lord for the comfort and security we have in knowing that on the worldwide scale, God has everything in his control. Enemies who look mighty and strong cause real havoc in our lives, but they are seen and known by the Lord, the sovereign and just king of the world. God has things under control, and we, will, we can know that he will ultimately see that justice is done. Secondly, we should live in comfort and with thanksgiving, for the Lord has justified his children through Jesus. Jesus had made certain that people of all nations are saved and justified. He's defeated the powers of sin and Satan and hell for us. We need to tell that good news to the nations, like David says in the psalm. We need to shout it out because we are so thankful for God's goodness to us, his saving mercy. And part of that thankful response is seeking to see justice done in our small corners of the world. We should want our life on earth to be patterned after God's design for the world. We should aim to make our lives offerings of thanksgiving to God. We love him, and therefore we love what he loves, justice for the oppressed, among many other things. The refrain of the old Psalm 9 hymn I grew up singing says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth, all the nations, hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the peoples 
Again, all the nations of the earth rejoice. We'll come to the Lord God, declare ye his fame, and give him all honor, for just is his name. May our lips and our lives bear witness to our thankful hearts that the Lord God has done great things for us. Praise like David's that we can hardly contain should be the motivation, the desire, the chorus of our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, you are high and highly to be exalted and praised. And we lift our thanksgiving to you. Lord, we declare your fame. We declare your glory. We declare that we are in awe of your saving grace, in awe of your justice. And we pray that we may pattern our lives in thankfulness for, to you for all your saving work. And also in thankfulness that exalts, or res, sorry, results in praise and thanksgiving. And also in a life of thanksgiving that seeks to love justice and do mercy and to walk humbly with our God. So Lord, will you lead us and guide us today and every day that our lives may tell of your goodness and mercy, of your justice and love. In Jesus' name, amen.